Welcome, Knights of the World Table. This is the final episode of our four-part series called How to D&D. In this episode, we briefly take our new player, Jessica, through the character creation process so that she can create a character she's excited to play in the future now that she's gotten a taste of the game playing with a pre-made character. Before we begin with that episode, I wanted to share some quick thoughts for DMs introducing new players to the game. The big thing is that your primary goal is not to teach them everything they need to know. Your primary goal is to leave them excited to come back and play more and learn more about the game. So keep up the pace, look for opportunities to make them the hero, and most of all, leave them wanting more. You may have noticed in the one shot, I left a few loose ends hanging, and that was on purpose. Who's this guy, Mari? And what's the deal with this seemingly magic treasure box? Leaving the new player with some questions that might lead into the next adventure is a great tool for bringing them back to your table. They're going to be thinking about that. They're going to be wondering. They're going to want to come back and answer those questions. If you have questions yourself, you can send them to us on Twitter at Rolled Table or on Instagram at Knights of the Rolled Table, and we might answer them there or possibly on a future how-to episode. Well, thanks for listening, and here is episode four of How to D&D. back this episode is going to be about how to build a character we're going to do real the basics of how to build a character and just kind of run through the steps because the character building process can get super detailed and some people really like to consider every possible combination of classes and numbers and how to tweak things you can go way deep into a backstory some people write short stories and all of that which can be a lot a lot of fun but we're really just going to kind of give you the basic steps of how to build a character importantly is if you're joining a group you definitely want to do this in collaboration with your dungeon master because they might have specific guidelines about this is the kind of world this is what's going on they can definitely work together there also might be things pre-established in terms of like well people of that profession are more like this or I don't want any elves in this campaign because there's a story about how the elves were all taken away whatever you just want to work with that dungeon master to be collaborative so Jessica you played really briefly Lyra a tiefling warlock Uh, we can keep working off that model a little bit we'll still talk about how to choose a race how to choose a class but um, what are you feeling in terms of like you usually start by either choosing a race or choosing a class. Class really de- kind of defines what you're going to be doing. You got to see a little bit of a cleric, a little bit of a paladin. There's other classes out there like druids that are more connected to nature, rangers that are also kind of naturey mixes of different um, melee attacking, spell attacking, wizards we mentioned, um, just straight up fighters that like to hit things. How are you feeling in terms of choosing a class uh i really enjoyed the warlock class Mm -hmm. i liked the uh option to do a range attack or to do magic um i felt like you had a lot of options um the one thing i thought would be fun in addition to the warlock class if i were to like make a new character Mm -hmm. would be like i guess the rogue is that a class okay yeah yeah. um because we ran into that a little bit with the lock picking Mm -hmm. and um i really enjoyed having high charisma and being able to lie and intimidate people oh yeah yeah, much like in my real life yeah um so i thought that would be kind of a fun path to go down as well yeah so let me throw out some ideas about that there are rogues uh, which didn't even cross my mind when i was re re throwing out different classes there but so that is generally the sneaky classes they would have high dexterity, usually. Definitely your character choices about Rogue doesn't have to necessarily be like, I'm the lying, thieving person. You can have super honorable Rogues. So <laughs> that's definitely an option. There's some subclasses of Rogues that could learn a few spells or specialize in other things. Other things around that um, area of expertise is there's bards that can also have real high mm-hmm. skills in just like working with people and performing and convincing and persuading and deceiving, depending on the bard you are. They also fight. They also have some spells. They're a little bit less like jump out from the shadows and attack a little bit more spell casty. And Warlock itself, because it's based on charisma, is also good for just manipulating people, maybe less so with the sneaking around but you can also kind of build the specifics into that so do any of those uh 
stand out to you as like, yeah, let's experiment with one of those classes. Like other than Warlock? Like- you can stick with War- Warlock if you like it. Or it sounds like you were standing out to Rogue and I was just, um, so we could definitely work on a Rogue. I was also just like throwing out some other classes that have kind of what you're looking you for. I think I could see I think a Rogue or yeah. a Bard would be really fun options. A Bard is going to be a little bit more like you're like the face of the group. Whereas a rogue is going to be more like you're kind of in the background and you're kind of diving in where necessary, but you're not necessarily like as forward facing. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 That's a really good distinction. And you probably won't play as many musical instruments as Mm -hmm. a rogue as Mm -hmm. as a bard. Bard is basically like a performer entertainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You inspire other people. Rogue sounds fun. All right. Your inclination of like, let's cut his throat (laughs) definitely speaks to the rogue inside of you. For sure. All right. So we're going to go with rogue. We'll come back to some decisions around that. So um, so we're going to choose a race. So race in Dungeons and Dragons are literally like different types of physical people. There may or may not be much of a concept of like ethnicity, the way we might use the term race in modern culture. Race is like... Elf or dwarf, they are literally like different people with different characteristics. Tiefling, there's half orcs, there's humans, and they all have certain different specialties. Gnomes, halflings, which are kind of basically basically hobbits, um, sneaky. They're kind of a go to class for rogues because they get some bonuses. You know, we don't have to break down the details of every single race that's out there. Also, different races. Yeah, every time there's kind of basic races in the player's handbook. I think there's like eight or so, but every time they bring out some supplemental material, fifth edition has been out for a while. Mm. There's often four more races. You can be like a goblin. You can be a turtle character. You can be all sure sorts can. of stuff. But, <laughs> Cat um, people. It's always me. It's always yeah. me. I always choose the weird one. Weston is always something weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you were going to play this character for a long time, you might pour over all the races and mm-hmm. weigh out the stats. But um, of what we mentioned, what maybe appeals to you? This might not be the best choice for a rogue, mm-hmm. but I really enjoyed the tiefling. Cool. I thought, Tiefling's not a bad a, choice for a rogue. That is a rogue. solid mm-hmm. rogue choice. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. cool. I didn't know if the horns rogue. made them inconspicuous. No. <laughs> you just could put a little hood on. Yeah. And you're golden, yeah. Right? It depends on, again, like your campaign and what's going on. But there's kind of a general sense with tieflings that like people don't really trust them. Mm -hmm. There's this idea that they're descendants from devils and they're evil, which may or may not be at all true with your character. But they're definitely shunned and that can make some real Mm. important character choices within the campaign. But Maybe also people that don't care race, about that like there. I always sometimes try to think of um, how would this race that my character was born into, how would that affect their choice of class? So, for instance, somebody that is a race that has been shunned in public may gravitate towards a profession like rogue that would stick more to the shadows and maybe be, by definition, more uh, distrustful of other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they treated well, for sure. All right, so what we've got so far is you're going to be a tiefling rogue. Tiefling has various uh, stat improvements, knows a spell. You knew Thaumaturgy as a character because you're a tiefling, so you'll keep that. Your rogue is proficient in dexterity and intelligence saving throws. You're also going to choose a couple of skills. So there's basically this is a list of typical rogue skills, and you get to choose four that you're going to have special proficiency in. So... Um, acrobatics, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, investigation, perception, performance, sleight of hand, or stealth. Which of those stands out for you? Four? Four of those? Yeah, four total. I think there's going to be ten of those. Mm. Okay. I can let acrobatics and athletics go. Um, Does deception, is that... Disguises, or is that deception? Is usually just like I'm trying to convince somebody that something that is not true is true. So it's usually more lying. It might come into a disguise. It definitely would play into becoming trying to pretend you're somebody else Mm -hmm. in disguises. You can specifically um, have proficiency in a disguise kit. Mm. We talk about ways to do that based on your profession that might help. Help you out with that sort of thing. So, yeah, in the world of like, hey, this is true when it's clearly not true is going to be helped by deception. Okay, I think I'm going to try and make myself a little well-rounded uh, 
tea leaf rogue. Um, <laughs> tea leaf? Tea leaf. Or whatever they call it. Tea yeah. flame. <laughs> nope, that's canon. You're tea leaf. <laughs> I will go with deception. Okay. I will go with uh, intimidation. Nice. I will go with stealth. Cool. And I will go with performance. Mm, nice. That sounds fun. So performance is not necessarily even, well, is definitely if you're going to get up in front of people and put on a show, but could also play into like disguising. I am acting like this character and I have to perform that. That'd be a little up to, up to the DM and also up to just like the situation of what you were doing, whether you rolled performance or, or a. You cast some kind of illusion Mm -hmm. and you have to try and make it convincing. Mm -hmm. Performance is just pretty good for that. It, it, it's a fun ability check. Yeah. So some other things that come along with the rogue class specifically is you're going to have expertise in two of those skills. Um, we don't have to. We won't. We don't need to spend time picking those right now. But basically, of those four skills, expertise means you get double proficiency. So of those four, you pick two of them that you'll get even a couple more bonus points. So you're going to be really high. You're going to be compared to other level one characters. Really stealthy, really good at deception, um, because you're going to add your, like for stealth, you'd add your basic dexterity, which is going to be high for a rogue, plus your proficiency, plus your proficiency again. It's going to be like plus eight or something for that. It would be good. You also, the main thing about rogues is a sneak attack, and that is they get some bonus damage. If you are attacking from a place of hiding, or there's a couple different scenarios, if somebody else is standing near an enemy to kind of take their attention. You'd also get your sneak attack bonus at level one. You will roll an extra six sided die to damage at level three. It's two extra six sided dice and that keeps going up level five and seven and eight. So that's becomes real powerful and also really dictates where, how you need to fight as a rogue to really try to maximize your opportunity to always get that sneak attack damage. And the last thing kind of interesting is, you know, thieves can't. And thieves can't is like a language of thieves. It's like a coded language that you can slip into regular conversations with certain phrases that other thieves know. So you can take a little bit more time to communicate something to another person that knows thieves can't. That this is a good person to rob, or there's treasure here, or don't go there. It's dangerous. I set a trap here. You, Stuff like you that. Talk that thieves and would say something like, "The blueberries are especially ripe this year," and they're mm-hmm. like, "Oh, mm. yes, they are, Mister McGonagall." Like whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah. and then it turns out, oh, I, guys, guess what? I know for a fact that there's such and such here. Yeah, yeah. and there's yeah. symbols and stuff also mixed into thieves can't. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna choose. A background. So a background is like kind of your profession outside of your class also. Like it might be a job like I'm an entertainer. Uh, Standard for rogues is being a criminal. That's what you've been up to. It's how you earn money and spend your time when you're not adventuring, which isn't all the time. It might be you're a traveler. You mentioned wanting to be disguised. So the kind of go-to for a rogue would be, I've been a criminal. Um, But there's also something called charlatan, which I think your tiefling was. And that's also pretty shady. But here's the description of charlatan. Charlatan, You've always had a way with people. You know what makes them tick. You can tease out their heart's desires after a few minutes of conversation. And with a few leading questions, you can read them like they were children's books. It's a useful talent and one that you're perfectly willing to use for your advantage. So you're good with working with people to you. You know what people want and you deliver, or rather, you're promised to deliver. Common sense should steer people away from things that sound too good to be true, but common sense seems to be in short supply when you're around. This is a very detailed, (laughs) (laughs) shady description. The bottle of pink-colored liquid will surely cure that unseemly rash. This ointment, nothing more than a bit of fat with a sprinkle of silver dust, can restore youth and vigor. So you decide kind of what kind of schemes you do, but you've kind of been conning people. You get proficiencies. Ooh. So as a charlatan, you get proficiency in deception and sleight of hand, which means you can add sleight of hand to what we picked. And also you can pick something else in addition because you already get deception for this. And you have uh, proficiency also with disguise kits and forgery kits. So that's a kit. If you have some time, you can create a disguise for yourself. You can also do a forgery, like Mm. replicate a letter or something. Those are handy uses as a 
Rogue, I believe you also, I already have proficiency with Thieves tools. You got a pretty wide range of opportunities to mess with people. A charlatan <laughs> has a false identity. Basically, this is a character you've built up over time that has a history and things. You have papers if you want to really quickly become this person and pass yourself off as that. You've already kind of established an identity and history. So basically, like in D&D terms, I'm just trying to get everyone to join my MLM scheme. Yes. Yep. <laughs> <That's excellent. laughs> yes, yes. You are the, cool. the Cutco of... <laughs> you guys got to try these oils. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Yes, Exactly. So if that's okay with you, we'll choose that for now. There's like Great. there's also lots and lots and lots of backgrounds that you can kind of pour over. And it's one of those things, again, where you can just pick this because I feel like that's a cool character choice. And I want to play out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's fun. I, I have a lot of fun choosing something that doesn't naturally fit your character. Mm. So I'm a paladin. Actually, I've played a character who's a paladin, but his background is being a criminal. And paladins, cliche, are very kind of like Vin, very much like. The classic white knight, I am here for good, and my God leads me to fight the demons, and mm -hmm. this guy's a criminal. So how do I reconcile that in role play? That like, And it kind of comes across with this character that just wants to be a criminal, but like the light has recruited him, and he's almost like cursed to do the right thing when he just <laughs> wants to steal stuff, and that makes for a fun character choice. So there's that, and you can also, there's also just like pulling over classes to be like, I want something with disguise kit, because I think that would be fun. So we'll take charlatan for now. And the next piece is going to be rolling ability scores. This is something that is done differently depending on your campaign. You definitely want to talk to your DM about it because you can just pick standard numbers that you have to like distribute to pick your strength, constitution, wisdom, dexterity, intelligence, and charisma. So sometimes you just distribute like a, a base 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8 decide which is which. And you'd probably start, well, I'm a rogue. I want good dexterity. Let's put the highest there. I don't care so much about my strength because I'm going to use dexterity to attack. It'll be an eight there. What we're going to do today is we're going to roll for it. Basically, when you roll for it, it's basically going to come down to usually three D6s. But we're going to give a little bit of wiggle room. We're going to roll four D6s and we're going to take the the lowest one away. So you're going to roll that six times. We're going to get six different numbers that are a maximum of 18, a minimum of three, and then those are going to be the six stats that you distribute between your okay. for your character. So again, and roll that. We'll add them up, and we'll do that six times. I'll go ahead and write them down for you. Cool. Thank you. One, okay. two, five, six. So what's the total? It's going to be a 13, because we'll drop the 1. Okay. Roll again, so that's pretty good. Got another Eleven. 1 to drop. Oh. That looks like an 11 total. Mm -hmm. Great. There's Oof. another 1 to mm -hmm. drop. That looks pretty low. We got a 4, a 2, and a 2, so 8. eight. Eef. There's your intellect. <laughs> Another Ooh. one to drop. The other ones look high. Nice. Five, five, and six. So that's a 16. 16. Nice. Ooh, that's looking good, too. Yeah, that's a 15. Sweet. Yeah. How many more do we have? One more. One more. 12. Man, she rolled a one every time and always got to drop it. So 12. All right. So now we got to think about what you want to do as a rogue and distribute these stats. So I mentioned mm -hmm. rogues depend on dexterity a lot. That's mm -hmm. how they're going to be stealthy. They're going to attack using dexterity weapons. Mm -hmm. That's basically things that you throw or just require some extra finesse and not just like smashing somebody with something. Mm -hmm. So probably we'll take that 16 and make it your dexterity score. Other things we've got, a 15 is your next highest and then a 13 a 12, an 11, and an 8. So let's look at the other stats you have. Like I mentioned, you don't really need to be super strong as a rogue because so much is dexterity-based. Mm. So you might opt to make one of those low. If somebody tries to grapple you or grab you, you're going to be out of luck maybe if you're not very strong. Well, but You can still avoid it with uh, acrobatics. Oh, yeah. There's a dexterity. lot of situations mm. where you can wiggle out of that situation yeah. rather than arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> constitution <laughs> constitution is a little bit important for everybody because it determines yeah. your hit points. So you want that probably at least the middle of the road stat. 
intelligence is an important choice here because at level three, a rogue is going to pick some sort of a subclass. This is true of a lot of classes. At level three, you make a decision of kind of what type of that class do you want to be. And one of the rogue's options is Arcane Trickster. And that kind of rogue learns a couple of spells, not very many. It's not going to be your go-to. But you learn a few cool spells that will help in your roguery. And you use intelligence to cast those. So if you think you wanted to do that, you'd want pretty good intelligence. And if not, it's not as important. It really just comes down to a role play stat. Do I want my character to be a little bit bright or not so much? To be counter to that, you have expressed some interest in persuading, intimidating, etc., and that's going to be your charisma score. Mm-hmm. So keep in mind that if you do wind up using a higher dice roll on that intellect, then you're not going to have a higher number for that charisma. So it's just kind of prioritizing. So remember, 10 is considered to be average. So actually, only one of your six rolls is a little above average. That's an 8. Whatever we give the 8 to, you're going to have a minus 1 to that skill. Mm-hmm. The 11, your next highest is 11. That's going to round down, but at some point you might be able to beat that. So we'll consider that 11 something you're about average in. Everything else, you're a little bit better than average in. Okay. Yeah. What were you going to say? I was thinking eight for strength. Okay. So we kind of call that, that's my throwaway stat. I'm not too worried. I can take a negative one on strength and everything else Mm -hmm. have some ability for. What else are you thinking? Uh, A 15 for charisma. Okay. To Jen's point of all those persuasion tricks. Ooh, something else to think about right now is you, as a tiefling, you have a plus two to charisma on top of whatever you have here. Because you're a tiefling, you also have a plus one to intelligence. So you you could bounce your charisma with your 15 up to 17. That would be good. It would be a super high stat and awesome. Or you could take that into account of like, oh, my charisma is already going to be high. I might want to use that somewhere else. Hmm. Another piece is uh, that one, it's basically only even numbers that matter because we round up. If you have an 11, it rounds down to 10. If you have a 12, you're going to get that plus one. So hmm. shooting for even numbers is a little bit of a, a help in your stats. You, yeah. you do in the future get the ability to, to move things. them up, though. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Good to know. So, so let's just start with your decision about charisma. Do you want charisma to be... All the way at 17, or do you want to, um, you know, if you put a 13 in there, you'll yeah. get to 15 total. Let's switch the charisma to 13. Cool. All right. So we're done with 8, 16, 13. We've got an 11, a 15, and a 12. 11, 15, and 12. What are you thinking about that spell casting option? Do you think you might want to go that way or just be rogue, rogue, rogueness, or are you going to cast some spells? I think I'll be more roguey. Okay. So then you would not worry too much about intelligence. Basically, both intelligence and wisdom come down to role-playing as you're a brighter person. Again, depending on your table, sometimes your DM will be like, no, you have innate intelligence. You need to pretend to be dumber than you're playing. (laughs) Some won't won't, uh, worry too much about that. Depends kind of stylistically. But also that really, you know, may inform just decisions you make about your character. Yeah. Intelligence, as I know stuff, wisdom is like I'm aware of the moment. I'm perceptive. I get people. That might also book combine smart well versus charisma. street smart is yeah. the easiest way I've found. Okay, uh, so I think that for rogue, it's going to be more important to be people aware rather than book smart. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to give my. Let's see, what do I have? I have a fifteen, an eleven. 15. 13 and 12 are left. Can I interject Wait, with no, one right. thing 15, that I wish 12. I had been more aware of as yeah. I learned how to do my stat blocks and we experienced it already in my cleric uh, mm-hmm. a while back. Um, constitution is always important mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, for a couple of reasons. Not only is that going to affect your hit points right now, but that bonus as you level up it's exponential. So basically each time you level up, you're going to get that bonus applied. So even though like your constitution relative to everybody else at a level one might be comparable as you level up, the disparity is going to get more and more if you have a low constitution modifier. So especially since a rogue is melee combat, I, it's not a terrible thing to throw yourself a little bit of a, a, a bump on. So maybe 
constitution. And do I get a bonus for constitution? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, no, not... You're, not, right. You're a tiefling. You have well. a plus oh. one to intelligence. So if we stick an odd number in intelligence, it's going to bump up to the next even number. Okay. Uh, so maybe an 11 here in intelligence? Sure, yeah. That's a good So that good will end up being... A 12. 12. So you'll get bonus plus one added. here. Mm-hmm. So between Constitution and Wisdom, you got a 12 and a 13. A 15. Yes. Yes, you do. You have your 15 left. Okay. Um, I'm going to do 15 in Wisdom and 12 in Constitution. Oop. Those are the real basic decisions. Um, there's different ways of choosing equipment, whether you really need to, whether your DM lets you, or whether you're they're very harsh about like, okay, you have 120 gold to decide. You have to buy all your equipment your armor and your weapons or whatever. There's lots and lots of stuff. We don't have to, you know, go into the details of that. As a rogue, you're probably going to wear some sort of a leather armor. As you get into higher armors, if you have big clunky metal armor, it gives you disadvantage on stealth. You can't have that as a rogue. Mm -hmm. So there's, you're more about dodging. You usually have a special kind of like a dexterity based sword. Maybe you throw daggers, stuff like that. We won't worry too much about that. That pretty much brings us down to, so big decisions will come along like at level three where you have to pick that like subtype or whatever, but like we're pretty much down to what's your name and what are your kind of opening thoughts about what kind of character this is, what's her background been, what kinds of things have gone on in his, his or her life. Oh, on the spot, making it up. I like that. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I look at the stats and I let that, if I'm like, okay, they're not super book smart or they're street smart, and I let that kind of dictate who I think they are, where their priorities lie. Yeah. I like Zach's point of trying to put two kind of opposite traits together. Mm-hmm. I do feel like that is really fun for playing around with the character, which can be led by the point. So let's see. Uh, super dexterous. So... Um, you know what? Maybe I'm going to go with like a little Oliver Twist background. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I was one of those street kids mm-hmm. who is pickpocketing and stealing to survive, doing the whole thieving thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also has a lot of wisdom and has perceived that those type of people, their lives are brutal and short and it's not a fun place to be. So trying to change and grow uh, and is now on a quest to use talents for good, but it's really hard to break those early habits. Awesome. A little cliche, but no, I like that. No, funny. I don't think it's cliche. Cliches are cliches because they are effective. <laughs> and uh, something else I would really encourage in campaigns is like you can go in with your idea of what your background mm-hmm. is, but as you start to like play the character and interact with the other characters in your parties, you might really quickly discover oh, I fell into this kind of like sassy one-liner quippy thing. I definitely want that to be part of my character or I didn't react well to this person and maybe my reaction, my relationship with this other person, maybe we've known each other for a while. So if you come really solidly, concretely, this is my background and my story and everything, sometimes you can get stuck in that. And in your first session, you meet these other cool characters and other cool players. You want to leave yourself some room early on to like grow and change and shift a few things that you end up not wanting as much as you thought. And part of the fun too is like uh, allowing the world around you to affect your character and to change and develop as they go. And like, as you do level up, maybe some of those choices reflect what's happened on previous campaigns Mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. So that can be a fun way to allow them to develop. Yeah. One thing that's also interesting and I love about uh, D&D is when you level up, when you get enough experience to level up, you don't actually have to choose rogue level two. Usually you have kind of a main class, but if you want to, you can multi-class and you can decide my level five rogue based on some things that's happened is now going to make a pact with the arch fiend and they are going to also add in some warlock spells and you can get really, really specific and interesting characters out of that mm-hmm. out of some classes that go together really really well and match up well and really enhance their abilities but other times it's just a character choice of like these classes don't match at all but it's super fun to be kind of a clumsy fighter who wants to be a rogue or <laughs> whatever somebody who's dabbling in magic somebody who's dabbling in magic but isn't that smart and not that good of mm-hmm. it there's all sorts of fun conversations 
So let's bring you down to, uh, do you have a name in mind for this character? Uh, yes, her name is going to be Tessa. T-E-S-S-A? Correct. Awesome. So certainly as you start to put this character together, a lot's going to develop as you think about her and develop over time. But is there anything else you want captured in this character that you're creating before we wrap up? I think that she's a blank canvas ready mm-hmm. to be painted. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, that's the basics of character creation and the steps you go through, and um, that's been fun. And maybe, maybe if we're lucky, Tessa or another character played by Jessica might visit our adventures in Knights of the World Table in the future. Thanks, you guys, and we'll see you next time. Bye.